Good morning, Shiloh family. We are going to start off our worship this morning with See a Victory. Our next song this morning is What a Beautiful Name. Thank you. 
What a wonderful thing it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful thing it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not harm you. Hail torn before you. You silence the Our next song to start worship off this morning is The Blessing. Please pray with me. 
Dear gracious God, thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for being in our lives. Thank you for your unending grace and for your unending mercy. And God, I pray that every one of us and all of the Christians in under you and leading your name, God, please help us to reflect you. Please help us to mimic you and to show other people how truly amazing and beautiful you are. Please, God, help us to love others the way that you love us. Please help us to forgive and to move on and to just mimic your joy and love, God. Please help Dan's, Pastor Dan's words today. Help us to take in what you really want us to hear, God. Thank you so much for this family, for this church, for this community. God, help us to have a wonderful day. Help us have a great week. Help us to take this message throughout our week. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Emily. Beautiful job, guys. Thank you so much, Emily, gentlemen. We have so many gifted people that make our worship and our other activities just a blessing all the way around. I don't know if that's the Holy Spirit moving or a sound problem. <laughs> all right. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke starting at, uh, at chapter 3. We're going to go to Luke chapter 3, and, and uh, in a moment I'll read from that with you. That's how we'll begin. As you find that, let me just say that uh, I'm very grateful to Emily for her leadership today and, and uh, the gentleman who came alongside her in this. Uh, Jessica is going to be leading this, this uh, second service worship but uh, have prior commitments that'll keep her out of this service today and next Sunday, but then after that, you'll be seeing more of her, but I think Emily and her group did a fantastic job, and uh, I'm mighty grateful for you. So, open Luke chapter 3 and start at verse 15 with me and follow along. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming to uh, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in, the hand, in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people, but Herod the Tetrarch, who had been uh, reproved by him for uh, Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked, uh, and so he locked John in prison. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying the heavens reopened, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. And that's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I want you to think about that passage, especially the part where God the Father says of the Son, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Now, now that you've reconsidered that, I want to ask you to think about a passage we read from last week and a particular line from the Gospel of John that said, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of a man, but of God. And so, here we have two phrases from the Gospels, the story of the good news of Jesus Christ. One wherein John the Apostle tells us that because of Jesus, we are sons and daughters of God. And in Luke's Gospel, he says that God the Father 
looked down upon his son and said, This is my child with whom I am well pleased. So I'm going to put those two together and come to a conclusion that might shock you. Because maybe you haven't thought about it in a while, but do you know what that means? It means that when God looks at you, redeemed by his son, he sees a son or a daughter and he says, that's my kid and I am well pleased. Thought about that lately? I told you a couple of weeks ago that you're going to hear some shocking things in 2022 because I'm tired of pussyfooting around with church we're going to do some real honest to goodness holy spirit filled gospel stuff all right and here's the news if jesus has made us sons and daughters of god then when god looks at you he sees a son or a daughter with whom god is well pleased that means that when you look at yourself in the mirror Early in the morning, before your coffee, before your makeup, before your brush or your comb, before you, before you even see clearly, whatever you think, when you look in the mirror, God thinks, that's my kid with whom I am well pleased. When you've had a moral failure, when you've slipped up in your thinking and been harsh or cruel or judgmental of others, Jesus has made you God's kid with whom he is well pleased. We have to get that through our heads. And I'm going to tell you in no uncertain terms as a student of history, as somebody with an expensive education, that church has routinely screwed this up. (laughs) This most important truth about who you are in Christ Church has messed up, and I'll tell you why. Because earthly women and men whose flesh dominates their spirit find that it is more beneficial for them to make you think that you have no, that you give God no pleasure. They want you to think that there's nothing about you that God particularly likes. To put it another way, the church. The religion of the church has learned to capitalize on your guilt and shame. After all, it makes the institution stronger. You know, I was just having the best time with our young people upstairs. Uh, I'm their teacher this month. And, and one of the things we were talking about is that the church is in decline right now. They were telling me that religious activities that are associated with the schools and the other churches, the young people's ministries are in decline. They were telling me that, and I was sort of surprised. And then I told them something that maybe surprised them. I said, well, guess what? Adult ministry is in decline right now, too. Fact is is that after the COVID shutdown, nothing has come back to the strength that it once was. And there's a lot of mystery around that question, but the one thing that we can agree on is there are fewer of us and if there's one thing the church has capitalized on in the past in order to increase its numbers it is guilt and shame you know because when people feel guilty and ashamed they got to go somewhere and if there's one thing that's wrong with our society right now I think we could all agree is there's not much guilt or shame about anything right okay So now that we've established a couple of of things, I will tell you that in my opinion, the religions that have emerged over the years after Christ's resurrection and ascension and the birth of the church at times have been incredible expressions of God's amazing grace, but they have also at times become incredibly dogmatic, broken institutions that capitalize on the way we naturally feel bad about ourselves, okay? And therefore, the message that you are a son or daughter of God with whom God is well pleased is suppressed. And this is why. Well, if you were in here for several weeks as I taught church history classes over the last part of last year, 
you heard that it all kind of came to a head in the 1500s over something called indulgences. Wasn't enough to capitalize on the negative feelings you have towards yourself. The church figured out that we could charge you to guarantee you a place in heaven. For a small fee given regularly to the church, we can assure you that your loved ones will be in heaven when they die. And for a little bit more, we can even act now and we'll double the offer and give you not only access to heaven for your loved ones, but for yourself as well. Now, when that happened, a handful of believers said, whoa, wait, time out. <laughs> nah, that ain't right. That ain't right. So reform and, and rebellion are one and the same in church, and they come on a regular basis. And so in a way, what I'm trying to do right now is rebel against the status quo. We aren't told often enough that we have been made children of God because of Jesus Christ, and God is pleased with us. And you are probably like me trying to figure out how in the world he could possibly have been pleased with you this morning when you said that horrible word about the one who just pulled out in front of you without giving you a second to react. And you're thinking, how could God be pleased with me? Maybe you were thinking that God can't possibly be pleased with Christians who believe certain things are okay that I know in my heart are not okay. Maybe you're having a hard time figuring out how God can be pleased with things that you're not pleased with, whether they're things about yourself or others. And here's what we really came here to talk about this morning. We need to understand the nature of sin, the nature of our redemption, and the nature of the church with a capital C, the family of Christ. Okay? Sin, first of all, is something that you can't quantify if you're trying to figure out what moral behaviors are acceptable in the eyes of God and what moral behaviors are not acceptable in the eyes of God. People do that, you know. We've been doing it for as long as there's been church. We determine within our social norms and within our, our religious social environment which moral behaviors are acceptable and which are not. But that changes over time, doesn't it? Because it's subjective. And so if we're honest, we can't say that sin is about a set of moral standards. We have to see sin in a different light. And so we go back to the origin of sin. We go back to the very beginning of the Bible, the premise upon which the entire biblical narrative is built. God made us to be perfect in God's image, but God had an adversary, an enemy, who wanted to corrupt that perfect image. The reason this adversary did this is because this adversary had developed a certain amount of pride and self-importance and, and uh, sort of, uh, you can't say flesh in the same sense that we think of ourselves, but, but a certain desire for temporal power. And so this enemy, we call him Satan, basically says to God, I know you created me, but now I think I'm better than you. And I can do this better than you. And I wish you would just go away and let me be God from now on. I was talking with our young friends a little while ago, and I said, you know, everybody wants a point in their life where they can be independent of their parents and not be told what to do all the time. But wouldn't it be absurd to say to your parent, I really don't think you've done a very good job of being parent. I will take over the parenting in this house from now on. Oh, wait, that does happen sometimes, doesn't it? How does that work out? Well, there you go. So what happens in the heavenly family? God casts out God's enemy and all of those who follow. And so we have this adversary whose fundamental problem is a degree of self-importance and a lack of respect for God that prevents harmony in the relationship with God and the appropriate order. That's sin. That is what sin is. 
the, we have Jesus who is the perfecter of our, our glorified nature and we have Satan who is the perfecter of the sin nature, right? So then when Satan enters into the garden and the people are there, he convinces them to believe as he does that God isn't acting in their best interest, that God's view of things is corrupt. He convinces them to believe like he does that there's something generally wrong with God. Okay? And once they believe that, they can no longer be in the presence of God in the same way that they were. Now, sin then, by its very nature, is not about moral things as much as it is about your attitude towards God and how you act that out. Now, that's something that's universal. That doesn't tie itself to moral standards or moral codes or societal norms. That has everything to do with who God is and how we view ourselves in relationship to God. And you can think that over because the truth is, is I'm, that's a sermon for another day. What you need to realize is that if you still haven't repented of a general disrespect for or lack of regard for your creator and uh, irreverence toward God, then that lack of repentance is separating you from God. For those who have repented, there is a way of salvation, and it's the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that we just read, is the perfecter of our faith. He's the one who, when we trust that he has purchased our redemption, that is, he's settled our account with God, he's canceled the power of sin and death, and therefore through him we are redeemed or we are saved. Now, once we've accepted that, we, like Jesus, are children of God having been born again into God's family, restored at least in our nature to the Edenic, that is, the way it was in Eden. Now, the next thing is something I want to direct you to the Apostle Paul for guidance. So we're going to read from Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 18. Romans 5, starting in verse 18, the Apostle Paul explains it this way. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness led to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So what's the Apostle Paul telling us? Basically, he's telling us that through Christ, we're pure, but imperfect. You are pure, but you're imperfect. So when God sees you, he really sees you standing in the shadow of his son, Jesus. It's not your righteousness that has made you acceptable in God's sight. It's Jesus' righteousness. So I want you to think about something. When we were studying Revelation together a while back, we saw this image of Christ returning with all the saints 
walking behind him like a column, right? That's what I picture in my mind. I mean, two by two or in family groups. But out in front, there's Jesus moving from eternity back into time and all the saints walking like soldiers in a column behind him. Well, I want you to imagine that right now, before that time, we are doing the same thing, but we're walking towards the throne of God. We're walking behind our leader, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ in columns, moving toward the throne of God's grace. And the reason we're welcome in God's house and at the throne of God's grace is because of who we're walking behind. These are my children with whom I am well pleased. Because of who they're walking behind. That's why we call him Lord. That's why we call him King. That's why we are moving towards the kingdom of Christ. And so when Paul says that we are dead to sin, he doesn't mean that our moral behavior has particularly improved, but that there is no power beyond our ability to overcome sin. Again, this is not about moral behavior until it is about your behavior toward God the Father. Again, referring to this wonderful conversation I have with our young people, we were talking about how the goal that I have always had as a pastor is that I might lead you to have a biblical Christian worldview that I might be able to help you with the grace of God to take off the world's lenses and replace them with the eyes of Christ, that you might view all things through the spirit of God that has changed your nature. And this is the beginning of the end of sin's power over your life. Now you don't see things the way you used to see them. And it changes everything about how you respond to the world and to each other, which leads to the next point. Our founder of our tradition, John Wesley, says that basically Christians are on a journey toward perfection. He had various terms for grace that he used, but basically sanctification is this process of living out the holiness that was assigned to you because you gave up your power over yourself, you surrendered because of your sin and then you accepted Christ as your Lord and therefore you're living this sanctifying process which is just a word of saying, you know, that the Holy Spirit's going to keep polishing on you till all the buffed out places start to glow, you know, that God's going to keep working on you to perfect you. But what does perfection look like? Well, it's about as subjective as what sin is in our minds. If we think that spiritual perfection is something that has to do with morality, we're going to be lost in confusion most of our lives, and religion can really make some hay out of that. I'm not saying religion's bad. I'm saying that people corrupt religion routinely because the enemy corrupts the people who corrupt the religion, which is why we have rebellions, and reformations on a regular basis, as we should. But what is perfection if it's not about morality? Well, Wesley says it's the perfect love of Christ being birthed in you. And so you're born again in the Holy Spirit through your repentance and your acceptance of Christ as your Savior. And you're born again then in the Holy Spirit and your nature changes by the work of the Holy Spirit in you. And then your, your attitude, your worldview, your, your, your whole being begins this transformative process called sanctification where the most significant change is your heart. It's the love you have for God and for each other. So let's break that down for a second. Understand that before all creation, there was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They, as one being, are the creative force behind everything else that exists, whether in heaven or earth, whether in space-time or outside of space-time. And these 
these persons of this Trinitarian view that we have, these three persons, they are crazy mad in love with each other. They are this enormous, unprecedented, unimaginable, unquantifiable love. And the Father, for the sake of the Son, creates people to be the Son's eternal companion. Read Ephesians. And they, though they turned against God, are still created for that purpose. And so God creates, through the Son, a way of restoring them to the Son for this marriage that is planned, this union between the Lord God, our Son, the Son Jesus Christ, and us. And the defeat of the enemy will come as a result of that. So the first love that you will see changed in your nature is your love for God. That you would love God more than you ever have before. The sign that you have power over sin is that not only do you now respect God and consider God in all things and in all ways, but you love God. It isn't enough for you to just reject the way that you used to reject God, but now you love God like you just can't help it. Most of us have felt that way about other people at one time or another. As a father and a husband, it's happened to me many times, but now I'm a grandfather and I look at that little grandbaby and I'm just overwhelming with love for someone I barely know. And this is what the love we feel towards the father is like. We just can't help it. We just warm all over with passionate love for God the Father, God the Son, and the Spirit that unites us with them. And so the first sign that you are now in charge of sin is that you'd reject sin and replace it with love, but not only for God the Father and the Son, but you reject anything that smacks of disregard and disrespect for your fellow believers. This is a really hard thing for me to talk about in one sense, because after all these years of being a Christian and, and leading in church as a pastor, what I've discovered is, is that Christians are awfully cruel to one another. And the Bible talks more about our relationship with our brothers and sisters than it does about anything else. God cares deeply about your relationship with your fellow believers. If when God looks at me, he sees a son with whom he is well pleased, and he looks at you and he sees a daughter with whom he is well pleased, then what does that make us? Brothers and sisters. God talks a lot in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. Jesus talks a lot about the family treating each other right. What good is your love for God if you have no love for your brother or sister in Christ? What good is your devotion to the Lord if your devotion to the Lord doesn't manifest in acts of grace and mercy and love towards brothers and sisters in Christ? This is why I greet you as my family all the time, because that's what we are. And here's another thing that might blow you away. It doesn't matter whether you go to church at another denomination up the road or across town at a non-denominational church or whatever. If you've redeemed, if you believe you have been redeemed by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, if you repented of your sin, you were born again in the Holy Spirit, you are my brother, you are my sister. Period. Regardless of your religious tradition. So why? Why don't we treat fellow believers like family? The Bible talks a lot about this. And frankly, I think God is more angry about that than a lot of things we see in the world. God would say to you believers in his household, you know what, the world is what it is, get used to it. Outside my garden, it's always been chaos. Outside my garden, it's always been crazy, weird, abominable things because that's where the ruler of the air reigns. 
And until you enter my household, you're part of the chaos. So the first thing we have to recognize then is, is if we're going to develop the perfect love that comes as a result of our new power over sin, we love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, but then we've got to love our neighbor. And we're talking about the people in our kingdom neighborhood, <laughs> those who are part of our Christian family. We have to show love and mercy, long-suffering patience and forgiveness, grace beyond measure. Yes, some Christians believe in things that make us uncomfortable. Yes, some moral expressions of Christianity don't ride well in my head. But you know, before we can start trying to correct their immoral behavior, we better figure out where our spiritual health is. we got to get our sin in con under control by the power of the Holy Spirit and begin to fall in love with God. Because if you'll be in love with God first and then your brothers and sisters in Christ, the way that you approach those things that need the body to self-correct will be much healthier. I'll put this to you by way of an example, and we're almost done. So in the body of Christ, the Bible tells us that there will be times when the brothers and sisters need correction. When a brother or sister is, by the Spirit's guidance, appears to be doing something that is detrimental to their spiritual well-being, to the family's well-being. And, and so, you know, the apostles tell us that we should gather a couple of saints and in the spirit of Christ, go and talk with them about it. And so for love's sake, for love of God, first and foremost, and then love for each other in the spirit of Christ, we talk to each other about these, these things that seem to be hurting the family. The first thing that has to be clear is, are they members of the family? Have they repented of sin, turned to Christ for salvation, and been born again? I don't know that I want to try to say, you know, there's a litmus test for that. But honestly, the conversation is not equal. It's not generative unless those things have been established. So among the believers, there can be healthy conversation and generative spiritual development for the greater good of the body of Christ. That's what the church is supposed to be. That's why we put such a strong emphasis on small groups because that'll happen to a certain degree because Pastor Dan's standing up here talking to a bunch of you, but what really starts the generative process is when a small group of you get together in trust and confidence and like-mindedness and you begin to chat about these things. And then these wonderful, redemptive, generative, spiritual things happen that really uplifts Christ and makes us more like the bride of Christ that we're trying to be. Because, as Wesley put it, we're striving for perfection and we're going to keep striving for that even after we die. And the perfection we're talking about is love. The one thing we can imagine perfecting, embodying in our being the perfect love of God as it's expressed through Christ. So then that leaves one last point. What happens when we, the family of God, are talking to or about the people who aren't in the family? Well, outside the garden, there's chaos. Outside God's house, there's chaos. Jesus has prepared a place for us. He says, if it weren't so, I'd have told you, but I've got a place for you inside my Father's house, and there's room for them too, but they've got to come in. They've got to repent. They've got to choose a better way and then begin this process of new life in the Holy Spirit but until they do, we have no right to judge them and hold them to standards that we're barely capable of holding ourselves to, but without the grace of God. You see, Christians haven't helped 
grow the kingdom by being mean-spirited, judgmental, and expecting a world that does not share their redemption and new life in the spirit to be like them, to be conformed. The first thing that they have to see is how your faith in Christ has changed you in a way that gives you something that they desperately desire. And they will not hear it in your condemnation of moral behavior, your political rants on Facebook. They will not hear it in hate language. They will not hear it in rejection and arrogance. They won't hear that. They won't hear the grace of God that saved you. So we, the body of Christ, have every right and responsibility to hold each other accountable for our discipleship. But we do not share that right and responsibility with regard to those who aren't part of the family of God yet. Yet we desire that they would be part of the family of God, so what do we do? Live a witness that makes them want what we've got worse than anything. Man, we live in a market-driven society. We know how this works. We know why in a few weeks there's going to be multi-million dollar commercials on the Super Bowl. Because if a few minutes of the right kind of presentation can make people want something they didn't even know they existed, that, that you know, they want something they didn't know how bad they wanted it, if that works in a three you know, three or four minute span over the course of halftime, then what have we got to compete with that? We have unity where there's chaos. We have perfect love, or at least sanctified love, where there's hate and mean-spiritedness and bitterness. We have faith, hope. We have grace. We have mercy. We move forward day by day, even in these perilous times, believing that God is in charge and whatever becomes of us, whether another day of living or a new day in heaven, God is in charge and all is well with my soul. We have that. And the truth of the matter is, is if they knew, those non-believers around us, if they knew that God the creator of everything that is, was, and ever will be, the master of all creation, the king of kings, the lord of lords, if they knew that they could look in the mirror and see a child of God with whom God is well pleased, that would appeal to them. That would be something that we could offer them. When I see you, I see someone that with a little help from Jesus and the Holy Spirit, can be a child of God like me, who God is really crazy about. Now that would be something. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for your word. Burn it on our hearts. Change our nature, we pray. So you'll be glorified. And we will not only be pleasing because of Christ, but we will honor and glorify you because we love you so much with every fiber of our being. Amen. Now, in response to God's word, let's enjoy a little rest and worship God with God's tithes and our offerings. search the world but it couldn't fill me the man 
its empty phrase and treasures that fade are never You could clap even louder if you want. It'll be perfectly okay. We know that God gets the glory, but we sure are grateful for the way he uses people like this, right? Two quick things for you. Number one, uh, we're going to be trying to take down some Christmas decorations this week, and I'm not at all sure where the help's coming from. So if you get a word through the messaging systems this week that we're meeting to take down Christmas decorations and you have a few minutes to offer, please come. We'll take the help. It's easier to take it down, trust me. The other thing is, is that uh, I mentioned the importance of small groups and this accountability process. We have a group we call Iron Men that is uh, named for a passage that's well known for the idea that iron sharpens iron. In other words, we make each other better because we are accountable in Christ. So the Iron Men group is going to start up in February again with a new time and location. They're going to meet right in there in that Wesley Cafe. At 6.30 in the morning on Thursdays is the plan, and uh, it'll be an in and out, in an hour kind of thing because there will be those who are going to lead uh, and, and participate who are going to do that and then go to work. 
and uh, Ted Miller's here. He is the one that's kind of driving that, and uh, wave your hand, Ted. Some of them probably don't know you. There you go. So if you're interested, uh, Ted would be glad to tell you more. You can talk to me, of course, but we're going to uh, have the Iron Men. It's really, it's a men's group with a few minutes of, of uh, guided discussion and then some prayer and off you go to get on with your day. I hope you'll consider being a part of that because small group accountability, we call it small groups, but you can call it Sunday school class, you can call it, you know, social club, I don't care what you call it as long as accountability happens with the spirit as your guide, wherever you meet, for whatever purpose uh, you want to call it. If the spirit is there and you're holding each other as family responsible for our relationship with each other and with God, that's a good thing, and you need to be a part of it. Now, please stand. Let me offer a blessing. We'll send you on your way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And now go in that same peace to love and serve the Lord. Have a great week.